So the first thing I noticed about this Summers newspaper is how weird this picture of the Kraken is. Like, I just don't get it. It looks like they photographed a model of a Kraken. I think the implication is meant to be this is the real Kraken, like some sort of Loch Ness monster-esque photo, but like, it, it's clearly just a model on a gray background. While not really a mistake on their part, or even really a nitpick on my part, I just find it interesting that they refer to Onet as a village. There's also this weird section in the bottom right where Ness gives an interview about the magic cake. Yup, Ness speaks confirmed. I'll take down the video. Also just a weird continuity thing is that they say this takes place in May for some reason, even though other issues of uh, different newspapers have conflicting information, so it kind of just screws up the timeline or continuity or whatever you want to call it really. This page has a funny ad about the Stoic Club meeting. A secret meeting will be held at an undisclosed time to discuss unnamed details. That That's some classic Earthbound humor right there. Page 76 has this really poorly and weirdly laid out ad for the Hotel de Summers. Like, damn, this is ugly. You, like, you think I'm gonna see this and they say, oh, $150 per person per night? That seems fair. Although, of course, they never come into play in the game, the Natural Culture Museum ad on the next page actually lists business hours for the museum, which I just think is a nice touch. Even if, let's be honest, it didn't take all that much thought to do, it's just a nice little touch that makes the world feel that much more alive. Something strange about this page is that it makes no mention of Tony's phone call to the player and Jeff after you get the Stoic Club number, which is weird because it comes into play in a pretty major way later in the game, so it's just kind of weird to me they didn't think it was worth mentioning. Delam Today on the next page actually has an interview with Pooh, so there's two characters that canonically talk to newspapers and give interviews during the adventure. Another pretty interesting thing about this page is it's the source of that iconic official artwork of the Franklin Badge that we're all too familiar with in the United States. Although, of course, it doesn't even come close to the beautiful and magnificent official artwork that is the Franklin Badge for the original mother. The bottom of the page actually lists a bunch of the 1 in 128 drops, but erroneously states that the Bionic Kraken drops the Legendary Bat instead of the Gutsy Bat, though believe me, that's not the only problems with Gutsy Bats and Krakens in this guide. Right next to this is a breakdown of Paula's prayer ability, which I just, you know, it, although helpful, it, just kind of a weird place to put it, you know? Like at this point, you've had Paula for several hours, we're, we're at Dalam. I feel like this breakdown should have probably been in the Tucson Tribune, or at least like the Threed newspaper at the very latest. On the next page, this free firewalk ad is pretty funny. For a limited time only, Firewalks for You is offering one free introductory walk on fire to the first 50 people who respond to this ad. It's a $50 value and it's valid for a limited time only, so act now to reserve your space. I also like that it says this event will take place at the Rama Coles, which is in all likeliness, in reference to the original Japanese name for Dalam, which is Rama or Ranma. Page 80 is interesting because it characterizes Pooh as a bit of a player apparently. Pooh is popular in the land of Dalam, and he seems to be a hit with the ladies. He is wise and powerful and not bad looking if you're into semi-bald guys with ponytails. The time has come, however, for him to quit pursuing the girls and start becoming a protector of the people. Like, yeah, I know, it's not so subtle that many girls make passes at Pooh in the game, but like, I, I don't know, it's never shown to be reciprocated by Pooh. In the psychic power section of his little bio to the right, it shows off PK Starstorm really early. Like, I get that they're trying to show off how powerful Pooh's psychic abilities are, but did you have to choose the last move he learns in the game? I also like this final sentence in the mirror magic section. The mirror allows Pooh to take the form of an enemy during battle. The effect casts for that battle, and the player doesn't control Pooh's attack. Pooh effectively becomes the enemy. Yeah, yeah, I understand what it's saying, and it certainly isn't implying what I'm interpreting as, but I, I, I don't care. It's funny. On page 81, there seems to be a slight typo in the tough guy's bio. It calls him a beach bum with a B, instead of beach bum. Now, I thought this might just be some sort of slang, but I was, I was searching and looking it up, and I couldn't find anything matching this. So if, if it is something, let me know, because last time I was wrong about the one-armed bandit, which apparently is slang for slot machine. The bio for the Kraken below is also interesting. It starts with, when your party returns from Foreside, seeming to imply that you need to have acquired the melody of Magnet Hill before you can go to Scaraba, but this just isn't the case. On page 82, under the section, the Foreside Natural Museum, it specifically goes out of its way to say that the dinosaur bones are not real. 
which conflicts with an interesting piece of continuity that the bones are supposed to be dinosaur bones from the Lost Underworld, foreshadowing the dinosaurs later in the game, so I don't know why they would go out of their way to make this make less sense, but who knows, I'm not a professional writer. Something I didn't know is that if you see Venus before talking to Mr. Spoon at the Foreside Museum, she'll actually be too busy to give you an autograph, so I, I just never knew this because I never bothered seeing her before I needed to. Also, I gotta say, near the end of this section, th this picture of them heading into the manhole in the back room is, is just kind of weird and really makes it clear to me just how odd it is that this is just in the back room of a museum. I'm sure there's some super deep lore in one of the Mother 2 comic books from the 90s, but uh, I, I haven't read them. Something really weird is that Thunder and Storm's bio on page 83 implies that you can attack them separately, but there is no way to do this in-game. I don't know what led them to write it like this. I don't know if it's just a straight-up error, but in any case, you can't attack them separately. On page 85, where it talks about the Kraken you had to fight on your way to Scaraba, it makes no mention of using PSI Flash on it, which is just weird to me because this guide has gone so many times out of its way to mention using PSI Flash in places most players probably don't use it, so this one time where it would actually be really useful, it just doesn't say anything. Radio Static also, I have no clue if this is just like a writing style thing I'm not understanding, but the first sentence in this section, Sail on to Scaraba, says, After cracking Kraken, continue sailing. Like, it's implying that that's the Kraken's name? Calling him Kraken? I don't know, it's just weird to me. Also on this page, the Guardian Hieroglyph has this really interesting clay figure where it's clearly just the line art, but they like put it even on a stand like other clay figures are. I just know, I don't know about this, I think it's really odd and bizarre looking, but I kind of like it. As far as I know, this is original to the player's guide. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, that's the case, and I kind of like it because you don't see them going out of their way too much to create original things for this guide, so I appreciate it. In the Scarab of Papyrus on the next page, great name by the way, there's this section on teleport beta, but the guide never goes out of its way to explicitly mention it, which again, is just weird to me because it seems like something notable enough to at least say. Also, this official artwork of the Hawkeye is kind of interesting to me because it's like straight up a jewel and I always interpreted, at least from its game sprite, that it was some sort of like carved stone or something. I also find it odd that this section on the submarine in the bottom corner is calling what is clearly an ocean a river for some reason. And like, this isn't just like inference either, like this is clearly, this is clearly an ocean. On page 87, continuing on info about Scaraba, I find it interesting that the section on Rainfall just says, None. This page is just full of weird oddities though. Like this weird romance ad right below it, Enjoy romantic desert sunsets with the one you love. As ancient spirits dance on the wind and the golden sun slowly sinks into glowing sands, you'll enjoy the most romantic getaway ever. What? Then right below that, there's this weird weight loss ad, better than a spa. If getting into shape is on your itinerary, this is the place to come. Food is hard to come by and water is scarce, so you'll be guaranteed to lose weight fast when you travel to Scaraba. It's a popular stop on the diet tour. The slogan's also great. No food, no water, arduous work. It all adds up to lost weight. I gotta be honest, reading this one nowadays is almost kind of shocking with how prevalent the discussion of body images now, it's just very- I feel like this is something they couldn't put in now. A little note is that on page 88 they still refer to Dungeon Man as Brick Road, though later on they keep switching between the two names. On page 89 there is a blatant pentagram. Like, I know, it's clearly just trying to trace out for you the path you have to go to open up the pyramid, and in my experience I always thought of it as a star. But seeing it in bright red in front of this sphinx, it looks very off-putting, and I don't know how this got by Nintendo, and they didn't make them at least change the color of it. And I'm dwelling on this point because there was a huge Satan panic around this time in history, so it's just very interesting to me that this got by. Gygus' influence is everywhere, man. Continuing with weirdly laid out advertisements though, this convenience store section is all over the place with its changing font sizes and stuff, and I guess just to keep it equal, but it looks really weird. I do appreciate this official artwork for the pig nose though, it reminds me of something you'd see out of Mother 3. On page 90, this whole section on fight for the Hawkeye is a little weird. I won't read it in detail, but basically it gets a bit repetitive at points and kind of tells you to do things in a weird wrong order and most majorly says that the Guardian General is at a later point than he actually is. 
And I gotta say, getting this enlarged photo of the Hawkeye makes me think it looks a lot more along the lines of the tiny ruby that Pooh has that you have to give to the guy at the museum rather than the Hawkeye. Going a few pages down to page 93, I find it weird that they gave the Manly Fish a clay model to show off in his bio, but the Manly Fish's brother right below just has his sprite work. It's like, why not just recolor it? That's what you've been doing with enemies at other points. I get that it may have looked a little bit repetitive, but I mean, like, you're putting two of the sprite and the clay model right next to each other anyway, so it's gonna look a bit repetitive regardless. Page 95 brings us to the Deep Darkness Post, the most primitive publication in the world, which I think is implying that it is made by monkeys, which is awesome. In the bottom corner, it's clearly a stock photo, but this official artwork of the Sword of Kings is pretty cool. Which Pooh apparently also puts on display in Foresight? I don't know, this, this whole section's kind of weird to me. Weapons experts and historians are flocking to Foresight to view the Sword of Kings, a rare relic recently unearthed by Prince Pooh. The ancient blade is the first weapon ever used by the prince. It's a perfect weapon for him. I mean, a Sword of Kings for a budding prince? Can you think of anything better? Remarked medievalist Nancy Ramsey. The exhibit concludes tomorrow. Nice to know that our chosen heroes took a little vacation to do a museum exhibit. The last thing I want to mention about this page is that apparently like the Mr. Saturn, the Tenda are known to the world. They're again, like the Mr. Saturn, written in this paper like everybody knows what they are already. I guess it isn't so special that Ness and his friends were able to reach these locations, huh? And because of this, you know there are some tools in this universe, some rich guys that own houses in Saturn Valley and go up there for the weekend. People like this guy. And with that, on to page 95, which might just be the best page in this whole damn manual in my opinion. Starting off with this section, Life is a Mere Adventure. Press your luck to its limit and embark on a deep darkness jungle tour. Expeditions depart daily and last until all participants are lost. For a limited time, guests receive a complimentary economy-sized bottle of dysentery pills. Take your life in your own hands today. Personal safety can't be guaranteed. Life insurance and photocopy of will required. Award-winning location, the world's most dangerous tour. Special discounts for obnoxious people. I mean, we're already off to a pretty bangin' start because that is absolutely hilarious. On the right of the page, the average age is listed as 48 for some reason, which means these are some pretty strong monkeys if they can make it that old. And you guys know what I am literally always saying in every video. Monkeys that can beat me up are awesome. Strong monkeys are always a plus. Hey, remember this bird you can talk to to save your game at the beginning of Deep Darkness? What if I told you he has official artwork? Okay, okay, the audience doesn't seem all that excited. Well, what if I told you this was it? This is amazing! Do not act like this isn't the funniest damn thing you've seen in your entire life. Sakurai, I am begging you, put this thing in Smash. Hobonichi, I'm begging you, please make this a plushie. Also, strangely enough, they bothered giving the monkeys an official artwork, which is surprisingly quite nice and pleasant. It's just by these trees in the game, so I always assumed it was like a gorilla's nest you were sleeping in, but no, they just straight up built a little town, Planet of the Apes, confirmed in Earthbound. And last, but certainly not least for this page, is the wild animal hunting section. No guns necessary, the animals hunt you! Experience the thrill of the hunt from the other end of the barrel! Highly trained primates with high caliber assault rifles stalk you! Like, I seriously have no idea what is the best part of this page, everything on here is a damn treasure. Monkeys with guns confirmed in Earthbound! As much as I would like to spend the rest of this video series just dissecting the greatness of this page, we do unfortunately have to move on. Page 96 doesn't have any monkeys hunting you, but it does show you all the locations for the magic truffles. This focus section also makes a big deal about the monkey's love item, which I can appreciate. Something I wonder about page 97 is if these screenshots confused kids in the 90s. Because the one to the right shows Pooh in your party, and there's no way of knowing before that battle that Pooh is going to rejoin you towards the end of it. And the screenshot to the left doesn't make this clear because they're all underwater in a group, so you can't really tell anyway. I'm probably overthinking this, but I just wonder if there were some kids like, oh my gosh, wait, where am I supposed to get Pooh back? Do the monkeys throw him at me? The flowchart to the right of the page doesn't even help this, because it just kind of says, say hello to Pooh without telling you what to do. It even says, defeat Master Barf before that happens. But what do I know? I'm just a stupid monkey. Page 98 calls the Tendas the Tendites, which I think is just cute. And it also calls them blue for some reason, even though they're clearly blue. Damn it! Even though they're clearly green, even in the manual. Also, this section at the bottom of the page, what happened to Apple Kid just cracks me up. I mean, look at this. This looks so funny. 
just something about this big important text right next to Applekid's straight face, it's just hilarious to me. The section also refers to overcoming shyness as the book on overcoming shyness, which just seems unnecessary to change to me. Like, I get that it makes it more clear to someone who's just reading this without necessarily playing the game, but who's reading this when they're not playing the game? Oh wait, page 99 says the hole is now open to Stonehenge even though it was never closed. The manual even shows Jeff down there earlier. I think it's just trying to say you can now go into the base now that you have the eraser eraser, but it's just really poorly worded. Also, the military Octobot enemy is noted as being rare for some reason, even though it's not. Like, you can find tons of them in this room, what the hell? And finally reaching page 100, the Sword of Kings section. I like that the screenshots in this section show Ness get way stronger between them. Like, you can't really tell with the other three because they're not doing so hot, but Ness has like 150 more HP in this screenshot than he does in the previous. Overall, this section is pretty good, doesn't have any mistakes in it, and I'm sure they'll never make any mistakes regarding super rare items at any point in this guide. Right? Thank you.